Welcome to the Naples Community Church Podcast with Pastor Kurt Anderson. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you find this sermon inspires you, builds your faith, and gives you perspective to see God moving in your life. We trust God has great things in store for you. Enjoy today's message. Well, we're looking at the, the great ends of the church. And one of the core values of the church is shelter, nurture, and fellowship. And we'll talk about that, but we often don't think about the fact that when we finish up a service and we go to the table back there and have our way with those cookies and cake and everything else and talk with one another, that's essential to the life of the church. Essential. We don't think about the fact that when we do our mission work, when we, you know, collect some, some funds and we send it off to the Bahamas or, or we participate in something as magnificent as honor flight, that's essential to the work of the church. It's not an optional. And, and likewise, when we are educating, when we have our classes, whether it's the issues hour or Bible study, and certainly when churches have little ones, which we, we tend not to, but um, uh, we, we take it as a core essential responsibility that we, that we be, are educating one another and that we grow in our faith. This is, this, this is among the great ends, why the church is here, why we are here. And so this morning I wanted to share from the Gospel of Matthew, the 25th, 25th chapter, and this is the very passage from which St. Matthew's house derives its name. It's about mission and shelter, nurture, and fellowship with the least of our brothers and sisters. Hear the word of God as it comes to us from Matthew. And by the way, all the letters here are red. That means that all of these words are recorded from the mouth of our Lord. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand, the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison. You visited me. Then these righteousness, righteous ones will reply, Lord, when do we ever see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? Or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? King said, I tell you the truth, when you did it to the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, away with you, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. And I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. May God add his understanding to this hearing of his word. 
You may have had somebody along the way come up to you and say, well, Frank, I, I remember when you did thus and so. And you have no awareness whatsoever. Not a clue what he was talking about. School teachers have this experience all the time. They're just trying to maintain some order in the classroom. And then years later, they'll have somebody come up. You know, Miss Harrison, I remember when you said this or did that. And, and you have no awareness whatsoever. The right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. Just this past week, someone came by and dropped off two bags of clothes here, put them up here on that, in that little corner. I don't know who did it. I took it over to St. Matthew's house and I popped the rear end of the car and, and at St. Matthew's house, they pulled it out and they said, thank you. And do I want a, a, a bottle of water as well? I said, sure, and drove off. And the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. But the reality is, those clothes are going like acts of yours over the years. Sometimes you have no awareness whatsoever, but someone is going to be helped. Someone is going to be served. Now, these words are tough. These words are words that come from our Lord in a role that we, we don't see him in in the Gospels, perhaps except only in this place when he is the king at the end of time. And he gathers all people to himself. So it's this massive gathering that is spoken of in the book of Revelation that is beyond number. And the Lord looks out and separates the sheep from the goats and makes a declaration about that separation. The sheep are those who did those things. The goats are those who didn't. In other words, the great sin for which they are culpable is that they didn't do something. They failed to act. And we may not like to hear about Jesus being a judge. We don't like to hear about justice. But if there is no judgment, there is no mercy. If our Lord is not 100% completely just, neither is he merciful. Then there is no need for forgiveness. Then we're all just sort of in this big mosh pit of humanity. And it doesn't matter what we do. But a loving God cannot be a God that does not also judge horrific acts against our brothers and sisters or horrific acts of neglect of our brothers and sisters. Understand that the love of God is contingent upon God being a just God. The two are inseparable. So this is our Lord. This is the most compassionate man ever to walk the planet. This is the one who, who knows our hearts like nobody else. And he says that there is a division. The righteous and the unrighteous. And that division is not made up of people who spoke some magic words to make it. It's people who did things just because they were people because they were impacted and they responded to human need. They were the ones who were the sheep. Ones who had no awareness whatsoever. And those who failed to act, who failed to respond, are 
called goats. It's tough. But our Lord, our Lord understands the human condition. Our Lord understands the calling. And as the body of Christ, as his church, we are given the responsibility to nurture one another in a particular way and in a, in a particular direction. That is not so much the avoidance of things as it is the action, the doing of things. So that, so for example, when we do fellowship over here or when we come back on a Sunday evening or, and have our, our fellowship times together, that's practice. That's not the thing itself. The sharing of food is not in and of itself the thing. It's practice so that we understand the need for us to share with others. When Jesus says, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat, that's not a big thing. When I was sick, you visited me. That's not a big thing. He's not saying, when I was sick, you healed me. Small acts, simple, straightforward acts. When I was in jail, you didn't break me loose. You just came and saw me. And so when we do what we do, whether it's fellowship or education or mission, those things are not the thing itself. Yes, we can collect some money and send it off to the Bahamas and we, we hope that that is doing its effect. But how much more important when we are encountered personally by someone who expresses some need. Let's face it. We all find ourselves in that place of being the least. We all have been there and we'll be there again. There's none of us who don't know what it is to be in that place. And there's not a one of us who doesn't know the joy and the comfort and the encouragement when, when others come to us and visit us or call us or, or leave some flowers or whatever it may be, bring cookies that are left over after church, you know, that they include us and, and it means so much. I was talking to some folks in the church this week and they were telling me how amazing this church is. So we've had two people on that prayer list. You all saved them both. <laughs> One had cancer, the other ha had a debilitating disease and was in a coma. You saved them both. <laughs> I just said, you, you people are so sweet. I don't know what to say to that. They're trying to give me credit. I get no credit at all. I, I do know, however, that, that when God's people pray, things happen. And those who are the recipients of prayer, that's like giving someone who's thirsty water. Someone who's hungering something to eat. It's not a matter of us doing some huge dynamic thing, but just being Christian to others, especially those who are broken, who are needy, those who are on the edge, those who like in that slideshow we just saw beforehand, those who might not be very attractive to us. We just act like Christians to one another. And when we do that, I can bet that whoever left those bags of clothes, if I happened to run into that person and found out who it was and said, well, you remember back when, when you dropped those clothes? No, I, I, I don't remember that. It's so often the case. Rick and Ann Scott, some time ago, left some clothes and our microwave oven in there was left by Rick and Ann. And I was joking with Rick 
one day that some people up in a, up in a Mockley, some guys working in the fields in a Mockley were wearing lime green golf pants while they're picking tomatoes. And uh, he said, I don't remember those pants. Oh I, oh, I didn't remember that. And so the, the beloved of God, the blessed of the Lord will say, well, when did we see you naked? When did we see you in prison? When did we ever see you in prison, Jesus? We do it to the least of our brothers and sisters. Sometimes it's so unconscious, but if we have a way of acting, a way of being. You know, so often in church, the emphasis is on all the things that we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to do this. We're not supposed to do that. We know that stuff. We do it anyway. We, we have to get forgiveness for it and all of that sort of thing. But we put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. What this is about is about acting out with our faith. I stumbled upon this by asking myself a question some time ago as I was struggling with some of my more conservative brothers and sisters in the faith, particularly in ministry. And I was in an argument with one of these guys. And I said, now, now really, what is the Christian life all about? Is it about sinning less or is it about loving more? Because the reality is, if we love more, we're going to sin more. So we're stuck. If it's about sinning less, then I should never leave the home. Because all I have to do is have one guy cut me off on Goodlett Frank Road, and I'm a sinner all over again. So instead, we're to be out there engaged. And... We probably won't know. We probably won't know when, in what way, we did something that pleased our Lord. Leo Tolstoy tells a wonderful story about a man who was a shoe repair man. He worked in a small village in Russia, and all he could see out was through the he worked in a basement, so all he could see out was through the window to the basement. And so what he was doing is all the time he'd look out and he'd see people's shoes that he'd worked on. <laughs> and he'd know what he did. He'd replace heels or he'd sewn up the heel or this or that on that shoe. And, and he had lost a son and was grieving deeply and, and went to his priest and said, what do I do? I cannot... I cannot stand this any further. I've lost my wife and all of my children. And the priest simply told him to start reading the Gospels. And he did. He started reading and reading and reading and he found some joy in life. And, and then one night he had a dream. And in that dream, the Lord said he was going to come visit him. And Martin was so excited. So he started the next day and did pretty much what he always did. He was working on shoes and looking out the window. And, and it was kind of a typical day, except it, had, it was cold in Russia. And he looked out and, and as he had done so many times, he saw a, an older gentleman out there shoveling snow. And, and he had had him come in before, but he had him come in to warm himself up, give him a couple, couple cups of tea. And, and that friend thanked him and he was on his way. And sometime later, a young woman with a child was huddled against one of the walls trying to stay warm. And, and uh, he saw her and, and saw her, how cold she was, had her come in, sit next to the fire and made some soup for her and, and uh, did some coochie coo with the little boy. And, and then he gave her something to to fend off the cold, and she was on her way. And then, then at the end of the day, I eh, forget the third guy. There was a third that came, and, and he came in and, and was likewise taking care of 
by Martin. Martin did this every day. It was always something. Always something. Always a, it was a mom, a young mom with a boy who had stolen an apple. <laughs> she, had them, she had them both in. And uh, so he kept looking and went to sleep that night a little disappointed that it's just one of those dreams. One of those dreams that was so graphic that he thought it was real and turned out not to be real. But he got up and just was, was glad for his life. And then the next evening, he was reading the Gospels again. And then suddenly, in the darkness, as he was reading, Martin turned around and it seemed to him as if people were standing in the dark corner. But he could not make out who they were. And a voice whispered his, into his ear, Martin, Martin, don't you know me? Who is it, Ma uttered Martin. It is I, the voice said, and out of the dark step, Stepanovich, who smiled and vanished like a cloud and was seen no more. It is I, the voice said again, and out of the darkness stepped the woman with the baby in her arms, and the woman smiled and the baby laughed, and they too vanished. It is I, the voice said once more, and the old woman and the boy with the apple stepped out and both smiled, and they too vanished. And Martin's soul grew glad. He crossed himself, put on his spectacles, and ba began to read the gospel just where it had opened. And at the top of the page he read, I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. And at the bottom of the page he read, Inasmuch as ye did it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, even these least, yet did it unto me. And Martin understood that his dream had come true and that the Savior really had come to see him that day. So when we encounter one another needing nurture, needing help, needing a visit, needing water, needing food. We are being met by our Savior. You bow with me in prayer. Lord, thank you that this is essential to our life, to our life as individuals, to our life as a church, to our calling, to be people engaged with this world that you love so much you set your son to die for it. And so, Lord, may we be a responsive people, even though we have no awareness whatsoever. May we respond, loving others as we have been first loved. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior Christ. Amen. If you enjoyed today's podcast, there are a few things you can do. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. For more information, you can visit us online at www.naplescommunitychurch.org. If you happen to be visiting Naples, please drop in for our Sunday service at 10 a.m. We'd love to meet you. Thanks again for joining us. Have a fabulous day.